Welcome to Grokchain Conversations. This podcast is presented by a multidisciplinary group of legal, financial, and technology professionals to meet and discuss today's most pressing questions around the use and governance of the blockchain. Through roundtable dialogue, we will provide listeners with a full spectrum of views on where this technology is today and where it might be leading. The information provided on the Grokchain Conversations is for educational purposes only. The information provided does not constitute legal, investment, financial, tax, accounting, or any other professionally licensed advice. The views expressed here are those of the individuals, not those of their respective employers or Grokchain. Well, welcome, Martin, to another episode of Grokchain. It's been a while. Yes, it has. It has. But we've all been working very diligently. We have. And I think we're brewing up for a very nice topic today. Go ahead, please introduce the topic. Go ahead. So today's topic, we want to explore um, basically the, it's a bit of an abstract theme. It's the global unit of exchange, which is currently the de facto dollar, which is underpinned by the petroleum markets or the oil markets. So famously called the, the petrodollar back in the 70s. And that name stuck, stuck even though, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of become the benchmark. So the question that we posed recently in a, in a chat that we had was, we've got the system of a global currency of reserve underpinned by a natural resource, oil, and we're undergoing an energy transition. What happens next? And I think that's what uh, will be quite an interesting discussion. How do we transition from a currency backed by fossil fuels when the fossil fuels are being transitioned away from as fast as we can to save the planet? So, yes, the, um, at the, uh, I guess I, you got to go back as far as World War II or the end of World War II. You know, Petrol was a very important factor in World War II because of mechanization, much more so than World War I. And uh, if memory serves me correctly, um, I think it was the, the US president on his way to a peace conference, dare I say in Yalta, stopped off in Saudi Arabia and negotiated with the Saudis that uh, oil would be priced in dollars. And it was priced in dollars since then. Um, notwithstanding Brent, of course, but uh, still US dollars. Um, this, I, 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 affect, I assume that this impacted the Nixon administration's decision to go off of the gold standard uh, back in the 70s notwithstanding the um, uh, the two OPEC crises of the 70s. But, you know, oil is very fundamental, or we'll call it fossil fuels are very fundamental to the level of productivity, the mechanization and industrialization of societies. Um, and our, you know, we'll call it our modern way of living. But now with the transition to electricity based um, does the dollar's hegemony come under scrutiny there I say um, notwithstanding the dollarization of so many economies around the world over the last 20 30 years the EU think, uh, sorry go ahead go on the EU I think when you express Oh, express right. it like that so yeah, is we, we could see a scenario very simply where the dollar which is underpins the uh, the hydrocarbon industry plus major economies around the world may just change what's underlying it and the underlying would change from hydrocarbon to electricity and the world carries on as it was well you got to decide how that electricity is produced though correct so you know, here in the U.S., we have a lot of gas-powered uh, power generation. 
because uh, we happen to have a lot of gas, natural gas, uh, with its consequences, of course, due to fracking, due to um, what are they called, earthquakes and things like that. Um, yep. Europe last year with the with the start of the war in Ukraine found themselves in an energy crisis where the price of electricity being pegged to gas you know, shot up quite astronomically and um, governments had to intervene to essentially subsidize the consumer. I think the, the most rec recent figure I heard was somewhere around 750 billion to 800 billion euros throughout Europe to subsidize um, the consumer essentially, whether it be the individuals or industries. Um, so Europe is in a very precarious situation and they've actually started to work on reforming their electricity market so that the price of electricity um, can be smoothed out, if you like, with uh, fairly long-term contracts. Um, I think they're working on like three-year financial contracts, something like that, um, so that there isn't this problem, or theoretically there isn't supposed to be this problem. But the idea is essentially, with all the investments that they're making in green or renewable technologies, they don't want the price of that techno of the electricity generated from that technology to be significantly influenced by changes in the price of fossil fuels, even though there's plenty of electricity that's generated from we'll call it dirty sources, brown sources. Mm -hmm. So essentially a decoupling of the market. Um, so in our previous discussions, we were like, well, you know, will this have an impact on the dollar's reserve currency status? And more importantly, um, is there an opportunity to use blockchain or cryptocurrency technologies to create the, a financial market for this, um, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, it's called marginal consumption marginal changes to consumption within a particular country, i.e. most countries have a certain base capacity market, and then sometimes they need more because it's too cold, too hot, whatever, and they need to import marginal amounts of electricity that are produced elsewhere. Uh, or if you have wind power, you know, there's no wind, so you, know, you need to bring electricity from elsewhere. Or you could be a country where you're a net exporter if you're very endowed with lots of wind and lots of sun, if you build the infrastructure. Sure, sure. But you have to build the infrastructure. But anyway, it doesn't change the fact that our dis the, the idea is if we are moving to more renewable sources of energy, does this affect the reserve status of the US dollar? Uh, even yesterday, we had the CPI being announced, and the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States looks at core CPI, which strips out, amongst other things, energy. Because obviously, you know that has an that has a macroeconomic effect on the economy, because basically, all you know, energy goes into everything that is part of our modern lifestyle but the Federal Reserve can't actually influence that market, so they just strip it out. So notwithstanding it being the 800 pound gorilla, you know, oh, there's another gorilla in the room with it. <laughs> yeah, very true. So I guess if you're going to put something like, or create or devise a system that's using a blockchain, we're assuming this will be a public chain that everyone has access to. Um, it's an open marketplace. It's not restricted to countries or controlled by central governments. Um, you have a unit that's well understood, the kilowatt hour, the megawatt hour, whatever it is, or electricity. Gigawatt hour. 
people understand what it is yeah better what hours you know you can go on um and imagine there's some localization so in some countries people will only pay depending on whatever their ability to pay plus the, the um, availability of it so much per kilowatt hour whereas in other countries it may be more so we don't really have a standard price in the same way as you do for hydrocarbons and we understand what it what it costs to to buy a barrel of oil and that's fairly transportable you can send it across continents you know what you're getting for that is standardized in the same way we've got the kilowatt hour is a standard measurement of electricity however while you can easily export and transport oil you can't do the same with electricity so that kind of takes away the ubiquity of a unit of exchange being backed by a kilowatt hour unless you're doing a netting exercise but isn't there an assumption behind what you're saying that there are still big producers even when you or centralized producers to use a more crypto term um yeah. who are producing that energy as opposed to um a more distributed network where you're producing and consuming locally you know, if you put solar panels on your roof or you put a wind power you know a windmill um you know on the side of your house and you know someplace like mm -hmm. Mallorca, for example where you got plenty of wind you know maybe you're you're producing and consuming locally so you don't have these big producers anymore and the exchanges or the comp the, that are going on are going on at a mo much more localized level as opposed to having to be transmitted over long distances yeah i think i think that decentralized model is is quite well understood of you know you've seen various projects i think a, a really early one i saw on blockchain was was um a microgrid platform in brooklyn where people were putting solar panels on the roof and they were busy buying and selling electricity to the community um i don't i haven't followed that for a couple of years but i was quite impressed at the time that you know people put that energy into capturing how much they generated how much they used in that local marketplace um i guess it's if you scale up to a national grid then it is more complicated isn't it where you're peak electricity consumption times are how you supply that what stations come online what come offline what are the stations of last resort you, know, you might suddenly want to switch on your hydroelectric at a certain time or you might just benignly pump it back up when you don't need so much so there's 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 quite a few dynamics in a, in a in a national grid plus you've also got connectors between countries now where they they balance out between um yeah the different national grids so sure, if that... we do get to a point where we get you know cross-continent not just cross-country um transmission of electricity yeah there's a lot of money that's going into wind power up in the north sea and that mm. then needs to be that electricity then needs to be transported say to italy or spain or germany or something mm. and that's you know, how do you incentivize people, you know, countries in the north to make those investments when there's a certain degree of uncertainty whether or not Italy or Spain or Germany is actually going to buy it and when? Yeah. So, yeah it's problematic. You know, even, you know, even last year with the, uh, with the war in Ukraine, we saw that Norway had to step in and provide a lot of uh, Norway and even uh, I think Holland, uh, gas its gas fields needed to step in and you know, yeah. start reactivating those. Mm -hmm. And even Germany reactivating its nuclear power plants decided to go with coal in the end of the day, yeah. which is kind of nonsense given what we're trying, you know, what's trying to be achieved. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, going back to to the micro grid in uh, in in Brooklyn. I do have a vague recollection of that, but no, I haven't followed that project either. But, you know, that's, you know, 
if you know, we we probably have to go back to the you know Tesla Edison conflict of whether you use AC power or DC power. You know, yeah. If you're producing, you know, if you're producing and consuming locally, and you have lots of energy generation that's local, well, you know, you don't need AC anymore, do you? Or you only no, need it really. exceptional yeah. moments, right? Mm -hmm. But you, know, you you do find yourself in a well, you know, my computer uses DC power, my iPhone uses DC power. And most of my devices, they even have a little fan here that uses DC power. <laughs> it's like, yeah. What am I using AC for again? I don't remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Except to actually, you know, move energy from one place to the other. So may maybe it's a question of the infrastructure needs to catch up. So we're trying to do this transition in. in in a fairly brisk pace, but obviously investing and in, in setting up the, the really robust infrastructure needed is maybe the first step before we start thinking about how do we create a, a unit of exchange based on the underlying cost of a kilowatt hour. Uh, can you, can you uh, unpack that a little bit more? Not sure I follow. So at the moment we've got, I was reading recently that there's something like a five to 15 year waiting list for um, like new wind arrays, new solar arrays to come onto national grids because the infrastructure just isn't there. So the governments are saying we're going to switch off or ban new um, hydrocarbon cars from a certain date, 2050 or something like that, which is great. Then we all transition to EVs. And there's no charging points because the grid isn't ready to support this. So there's quite an investment needed to be able to create that infrastructure for the running where we need it, for this transition away from heating using um, gas powered or, or oil powered or coal powered housing, so heating in, in winter in, in Northern Europe towards heat pumps. Heat pumps need electricity. Electricity comes from where? It can come from many sources, but it needs distributing, you know. And I guess we've had, yeah, decades to put in the infrastructure for gas heating, for um, for oil heating, for coal heating. The distribution mechanisms are all there. So may maybe before we can get too carried away, that's the first step that we need. Okay. So basically, you're referring to the GM Ford deal with uh, Tesla. To use their their power their power um, connectors. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, yeah, that was quite a quite a boost to Tesla because you know they have the infrastructure that's there with all the charging mm. stations. Yeah. Uh, at least here in the U.S. and I imagine in Europe as well. Uh, Definitely. Um, yeah, and you, you know you have to get the power to those locations uh, if you still have centralized producers. Mm -hmm. If you have local producers, then you, know, you don't really have to transfer it that much. But you know, and you also have the ability to store locally. So a lot of that uh, supply and those supply and demand issues are also uh, or can also be. Uh, address through store energy storage. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be a combination of both. And then we will get to a point where the price, the kilowatt hour should be a very, very boring market to be in. Because we can handle fluctuations, you know, we, we, we can handle it two or three days where it doesn't, the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow. We've got enough in storage to last us. And then it kicks in again, and then we start distributing and we start reloading the storage and so on. Um, at that point, if we get a benign condition where we've got a very, very simple price that doesn't really move much beyond set band, it's not going to be very speculative because there's no huge fluctuations of supply and demand. 
then it becomes quite an interesting project to say, well, okay, we now have the stable underlying commodity that people need. And sure. therefore, you could start thinking about what's it, can we use this as an exchange of value? Well, it becomes ubiquitous because energy goes into our modern way of living. Mm -hmm. Correct. You, you know, I, I know that, you know, a lot of people have been very interested in, you know, storing energy and batteries and putting batteries in cars and vehicles and stuff. You know, I actually, uh, there's a company in Boston called Wintricity, which uh, uses electromagnetic technology. So basically you bury a power cord in the ground and you you pick up the energy from the electromagnetic waves that are produced from their technology. And this way you don't have to carry all that extra weight of the batteries. So your, your, your power lines, quote unquote, instead of being you know, in the air on, on these great big towers, they're all buried, which they probably should be to begin with, because it avoids them breaking and falling down during you know, inclement weather. But it also then becomes a, you know, a way of gener of, of actually propelling your vehicle. Yeah, which seems like a much smarter way of doing things. It um, does. Yeah. But yeah, you know, you're you're. Yeah, I think we're still in that situation of, you know, the Tesla Edison conflict, you know, do I have a lot of small producers? You know, if I if I put, you know, power, you know, power generation and I can take care of my own needs and I'm completely independent, you know, once I've made that initial investment for X number of years, um the energy market doesn't really affect me except to, you know, sell the excess to my neighbor or, you know, to the company down the road. Um, you know, while I'm at the office, you know, my home is still generating power so the local business can use it. And then when I come back in the evening, you know, I have a little battery, a power wall or some other product that, you know, stores the energy. Mm -hmm. And I can continue, you know, and I can, you know, live the way I like to live, you know, the way modern, modern people live. Yeah. So if we take, if we take the premise that electricity really becomes ubiquitous, always on, everywhere, then what is the implication for, for the hydrocarbon backed dollar? Well, the the hydrocarbon market still exists, but because you know we have to use hydrocarbons to produce you know, our plastics, our, our our windmill blades to power you know our nice big windmills. You know those are all made out of plastics. They're not you know, they're uh, epoxy, mm -hmm. epoxy fiberglass, carbon fiber, and so on, and balsa wood. I don't know why you would ever make a windmill propeller with uh, with balsa wood, but when you see what it does to sailboats, the rot you can get in there, I would definitely use a synthetic of some sort. But uh, yeah. apparently balsa wood is very expensive because they put it into those uh, into those propellers. That's great for you've got a, a forest of balsa wood trees. That is, we're making quite a pen, quite a nice amount of money nowadays. Yeah. But yes, the the you know, knowing where you know, pricing fossil fuels in dollars, you know, does give the U.S. you know, quite a bit of leverage uh, on the world stage. And you know we we've seen you know, Iraq try to move out of it last year. Uh, Russia tried to price in rubles, and that didn't work out so well. But you know, if you cut them off from the SWIFT system, you know what else 
can they possibly do? You know, they can't get yeah. dollars. <laughs> um, and you know, China has been trying to you know, to become a reserve currency on its own with the renminbi. Um, but interestingly, uh, a lot of people who have been to China recently are quite surprised by the number of electric vehicles on the road. It's quite, you know, they've been, they've been quite a big uh, boost, even during COVID, apparently. They've made quite a number of investments. The problem is, you know, even if you've got an EV, if you're using coal or, you know, or diesel or to run your generator to create the electricity, it's still dirty energy. You haven't really achieved very much in terms of cleaning up the, the environment. But it would certainly, you know, it does certainly take um, value away from the use of the dollar as a reserve currency. If you start, you know, if I'm able to produce my own energy here and consume it here, you know, that unit of measure, you know, is no longer really relevant on the world stage. Apart from when you need to do some rebalancing, just saying you go to work, you're exporting, you come home, you might import because your, your energy needs might be greater than what you've got stored in your battery or you know, you're limited by so many kilowatt outputs of your battery that you'd need to draw on the grid for more. So I think there's probably going to be some kind of marketplace to handle that in the same way. I, mean, I wouldn't say in the same way, but in, in the similar vein to the Brooklyn microgrid, where you start off and you're saying, right, well, Net, I exported this much. I imported this much. What do I owe? Who do I owe it to? And right. you work out if you're a surplus or you're you're a net mm -hmm. user of uh, of kilowatt hours. And right. then it's it's not a huge leap of faith to start saying, well, you know, kilowatt hour for me costs me this much, or I earn this much from it. You can start doing comparisons with other countries because we're talking exactly the same unit of value. Now that point it becomes interesting because unlike you with a uh, with a dollar where it's both underpinned by a commodity and it's controlled by a single country, well controlled it's it's issued by a single con con uh, country. I don't know how much control the U.S. really has over the dollar. I don't think the U.S. Um, knows either. But... <laughs> no one really knows, but, but if you change the the whole um, premise of of what the unit of exchange is from this kind of murky, it's a commodity commodity back currency versus a one that's yeah it's got some kind of sovereign connection. If you then had a universal one that was only really accounted for by the kilowatt hour underpinned by that, then the geopolitics starts getting very interesting. Oh, that it does. That it does. Because but you before, don't really have any central ownership then. No, but yeah, it's it's kind of like the air at that point. Nobody really controls the air. Uh, but you know, before we get into the geopolitics of the question um, or the subject, um, is there something that is some underlying technology that it becomes a requirement for creating such a a, a marketplace? Um, you know, like smart, uh, what are they called? Smart readers, smart, um, what are they called? Yeah, I think, smart, yeah, the, the smart, the smart, smart. Yeah, the smart uh, meters. Smart called meters, smart meters is that yeah. what they're called yeah yeah because basically you need that measurement that verifiable measurement of what you're producing plus mm -hmm. you know what you're consuming and therefore you can really track quickly what your surplus is and, and what your input or exports and imports are effectively mm -hmm. and that's what you know that's where the economy starts building the question is though how do you factor in the infrastructure costs? So for me to be able to export into a grid or import when I need it, there needs to be a grid. 
someone needs to run that and maintain that grid. Sure. But isn't and that so like how the, is, internet? How does... the internet is electricity, right? It doesn't belong to anyone. It's a public good, so to say. Yeah. You know, there it's in everybody's interest to maintain, you know, their little piece of it so that everybody can interconnect. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, however, when you start talking about smart meters, aren't you also, uh, you know, opening up the system to people playing around with it, and falsifying information? You're always under risk with that sort of thing with technology. Um, just just like now, you know, the, the OPEC commit to pumping so many barrels. Is that really, do people cheat? We know that the more cheat, barrels produced than or sell, less. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think every system, you know, it would need audits, it would need monitoring. That's the whole point of how trustworthy you are. So, you know, if you were, if you're in a in a region that was magically claiming to export gigawatts of the stuff to claim all sorts of money off people, and you weren't, then your reputation comes under line there. You know, would you really take it on face value that region X Y Z is really producing a kilowatt? You want to ask mm -hmm. for more verification than just their say so? Yes. Well, you know, if you have a a power generating device that, uh, whether it's a solar panel or wind, um, or even a bicycle or something else, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know how many kilowatts that can generate. And if you're selling more than what your infrastructure allows you to do, you know, there's, there's a problem there. Yeah. But you know, to go back to what you were mentioning, you mentioned before, how do you incentivize people to make these investments? Uh, not only in the grid itself, but, you know, in the actual, in, you know, the actual materials that are required. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there, is there the opportunity to use something like cryptocurrency to subsidize the market until it actually develops? I suppose the way you could do it is you kind of create a system of credits to begin the thing with that you could issue. Say, well, okay, you need to put something on your roof or have something in your garden that generates electricity. Um, so may maybe the, the people that... that that manufacture these or there's there's a market there to say well if you want to be in the system you need to start contributing or you're just consuming so it's going to cost you more so when you net out you have fair fair incentive to put something in maybe draw on something at the right times but your netting out process means that you're not not really spending a lot of energy because you're producing quite a lot so it's it's kind of skewed, but if you have money, then your energy is going to cost nothing because you're going to invest in it. So how do you tackle that proportion of the population that don't necessarily have the ready available capital to buy or to invest in the, the infrastructure they need to be able to export or consume well, their own electricity? Taxation? It's either taxation. Isn't that or... a fiscal policy? You, know, you, you come in with the, you know, Say we're going to subsidize the acquisition of solar panels or of um, you know some other devices and your smart meter, of course. Mm -hmm. you know, in the same way that we subsidize people insulating their home or um, you know putting in double paned or triple gl pane glass or you know them buying a new car because you know, after X number of years, you know it's don't want cars that are that old road because it's not healthy and you know, use fiscal policy to do that I, mean, I i've been you know i live in florida and recently i've been seeing ads probably because of the inflation reduction act mm -hmm. where you, know, you can actually get solar panels for free mm -hmm. they're completely subsidized 
and you know, we're you know, in this residence, we're doing work. And yesterday, I was talking with the manager of the the condo, the property manager. So you know, we're putting all in all this money to do all this work, but you know, we have this free stuff that we can get, you know, just to cover our electric costs. You know, yeah. Why aren't we getting that money? <laughs> Why aren't we making those investments, which would be good towards the future? And that comes back to what you're saying earlier about the the, the big subsidies in Europe to 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 soften the blow of the uh, the spike in prices. You know, if you put those kinds of sums, was it seven hundred billion? You said seven fifty to eight hundred last year, but yeah, in the in this year's budget, there's I think half a bill, uh, five hundred billion. Hmm. Uh, if you stuck that into insulation, triple glazing, solar panels, then you know you're you're fixing a problem at source, aren't you? You're not having to do that every year. Ironically, from what I've heard from uh, different, we'll call them uh, academics, researchers in the space, the money that has gone into insulation has actually had a the contrary effect. Instead of reducing people's consumption, it's actually increased their consumption because now they're like well you know i'm not losing all that money going out the window so i can keep the temperature higher or the you know temperature lower i can you know have much mm. better climate control yeah so they're, they're actually and that that's actually a european statistic from uh i think it was what's his name jean paul pisani jean pierre pisani I think I read the same report. Yeah, it's a bit scary that. No, it's human nature, which is yeah. what's kind of interesting about crypto is you're dealing with you know decision making. You're dealing with microeconomics and how people make decisions and how you incentivize them to behave in a certain way using microeconomics um, um, as a as a structure. Which yeah. is why I think you know there there might be something there to design a uh, to design a market that actually works properly, but using microeconomic incentives as opposed to fiscal incentives, which often you know lead to greenwashing, lead to you know people increasing their energy use as opposed to reducing it. You know they're mm. they're very blunt instruments. They're macroeconomic policies that you know are very blunt and often have the opposite effect than what we're looking to do yeah whereas if you put it market-based then you're very aware of what you're spending or consuming well, if it's yeah. costing you money yes but yeah the the energy transition is definitely not part of the what is it called liberal economics um you know the, if you asked an individual do you want to change your car from you know gas power to electric powered you know they be like, I don't care. It depends how much it costs. So a lot of this energy transition is top down, as opposed to being bottom up. Bottom up. It's you know, kind of anti democratic in a certain sense. Yeah, I think this, this it's difficult for the individual because it's it's a nice narrative for corporates to say, take some responsibility. It's your planet that's burning, to to the consumer, and the consumer gets overwhelmed. So in the end, you get into this complete paralysis of what is the right thing to do? You know, I buy an EV and then you look at another metric that shows you, well, actually, if I hung on to my old car for another 15 years, I'd have less of a carbon impact than buying an EV. Because even though I'm polluting when I'm running the engine, the materials used to create the EV and the battery and all the rest of it is consuming far more carbon than, than running my old car into the ground. So like... This is the tricky part of, of this transition, is to understand what you as an individual, how your behavior can affect the overall state of the planet in, in, you know, in, in the use of energy. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good point you bring up. The cost of producing an electric vehicle actually uses a much more, creates more, um, I'll call them greenhouse gases, GH, hmm. CHGs, greenhouse gases, GHG, um, yeah. than it does to create 
to, to manufacture a, a traditional vehicle, a gas powered vehicle. But then the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted by using the, the vehicle are higher than using the electric vehicle, provided that the electricity is clean electricity. So That's the, the, caveat, the break even yeah. point is is much further out mm. than what you would think as a consumer, you know, I buy an electric vehicle and that's it, you know, I've done my, I've done my duty. That break even yeah. point is like, I don't know, somebody had done a calculation. I'm going to say it's 11 years out. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that graph. Mm. Mm. So the, then the challenge is, is if we're creating the kind of micro market, it's got to be very understandable with the consequences in that model of this is what we want your behavior to be and you're rewarded for that and you're punished for doing the opposite. How do you simplify it to the point that your average person in their busy lives don't want to think too much about this? How do we distill something complex into simple market models? Well, it's actually, you know, given all these, these contradiction mentioned, it's it's actually quite simple. We have to reduce our consumption. That's it. You know, yeah. There, it's not more complicated than that. We have to you know stop buying you know five hundred things a week from uh, from Amazon and having it delivered to ourselves. You know to us, we need to stop using you know stop having the need to travel uh, to all these different places. You know just for you know well as we've seen for work with COVID, a lot of people, you know, aside from retiring or withdrawing from the labor market, a lot of people don't want to go to the office. You know, they want to work from home. They want to work remotely. You've seen, you, there's a huge uptick in um, uh, holiday travel. Mm. You know, people going, you know, moving around just for, you know, leisure purposes. And you, you, we just have to reduce those, and that's that's just for us in the we'll call it in the in the more developed economies. If we want to start bringing into the into the world economy other countries that are under you know that are developing countries, you know, not everybody can have a, you know the same things. So we're going to have to. Uh, well, Europe has actually been pretty good about this. Um, as opposed to the US. Europe has a lot more invested in um, uh, what's it called mass transit mm. than the US does because the US has this culture of the car and freedom you know, the idea of the car gives you some sense of freedom, which a lot of Europeans have as well, unfortunately. Uh, but you know, probably there need to be a lot more investments in uh, uh, mass public transportation of some sort, where you know instead of you being by yourself in your car, you know it's still a two-ton vehicle, even if it's because of all the batteries and the stupid thing. You know, maybe you know that that equipment should be in a bus. Yeah. And, you know, you should you should have more bus routes or you should have. Um, you know, hydrogen powered buses eventually because batteries are still too heavy for buses, but, uh, you know, you, you have, you know, you have more. Um, yeah, more mass transit that people can use when they need to move around. You know, the Hyperloop is one example, but. Uh, the last time I was in Europe, I used to always use planes. The last time I used trains. And honestly, it was a lot more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's just about the same amount of time because you got to get to the airport early. You have to, you know, travel from the airport to the center of the city. You know, it's, um, there have been quite a number of advances in Europe that you don't have here, uh, here in the U.S. Mm. You know, even yeah, though there, you, there have been some improvements in the U.S., but not not significant. 
you hit on a very good point though because it's like it is that creation of demand and managing that and just because you know i don't know take a country like well it's a city like lagos where the you know, the traffic is is ridiculous you know it's hours and hours people sit in cars waiting to go places because it's jammed you're not solving much if you turn all those into evs so they're like yeah introduce mass transit that works um, sao paulo i hear is pretty bad that's why people who are wealthy use helicopters to go from one side of the city to the other because there's just way too, too much traffic but that's yeah. not really a solution either whereas if you go to a country like japan you know they have their high speed trains and you know i mean talk about running their system like a swiss watch i mean geez it's crazy yeah, right yeah. Two minutes in this station, <laughs> you either get on and off or you wait for the next train. But you know, there, yeah. there's enough frequency of trains that you know you can get on. And you don't mm -hmm. have to wait forever. But yeah, so they have, yeah, and you a, could all, and they have a very good system of mass transit. You could also argue that India is very efficient. They have a lot of mass transit and it's very well used. But they for just the last need a bit more. Years. <laughs> yes. it's the same one. It's the same. What is it? The the trains from the English Raj. Is that what it's I, I think they've built a lot more since. But even so, yeah, the the images you see. Um, but yeah. yeah. But that's. I think part of the calculation is is native. Like you say, it's reducing the consumption where there's excess consumption. It's pr provision for mass transit, not necessarily replacing like with like. Mm -hmm. Um, and thinking about how you do this holistically, but then comes back to creating like what models would work, what it, what economic models would really make us think about all this stuff and not just in the right way. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, un and unfortunately, you know, that's very much culturally determined. As we've said, as we just said, every country, every culture has their own approach. In America, mm -hmm. if you told people you can't have your own vehicle anymore, you have to use mass transit. You know, in a lot of places, they would freak out. Yeah, but also, I think what's really encouraged, like you know, the car ownership model is. Um, is it's it's got away from the actual price of the car now. All you're really doing is financing that that depreciation. You go and buy yourself a new car. You, if you lease it for three years, you give it back. What you're actually paying for is a depreciation between you picking the car up and giving it back again. And that's not yeah. necessarily anything to do with the cost of the car anymore. No, but that's then to do after with second hand the, markets and whatever. And right. And then there's a second hand market and then there's a third hand market and then a fourth and fifth. And then yeah. there are a whole bunch of different markets for automobiles. At least here there are. Mm. Some of yeah, which yeah. I didn't even know existed, but I discovered recently that they exist. Like, okay. Yeah. Uh, but you know, aside from that, you know, I, I remember in my youth. You know, a car was a vehicle. Mm. Now it's got so many buttons and bloody electronics in it. You know, the, the cost of the vehicle keeps going up because of all this technology that's put into it. <clears throat> Whereas if it was just a basic car, like, you know, back in the 70s or 80s, mm. probably 70s, here in the 60s, you know, it probably cost a thousand, two thousand dollars. You know, it wouldn't cost anything. And people would just be buying them like, you know, like McDonald, like a pizza. Yeah. Well, if you look back at old pictures of places like Turin, where everyone was in those tiny Fiat 500s, you know, that's how many cars you can fit in a city. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I watched uh, an old movie, Airport, uh, the other day, because it was put on Netflix. And I saw the size of the seats. <laughs> I, was like, I remember those seats. They were comfortable. <laughs> Yeah, not this crap that you've got today. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, anyway, we're getting off the subject. We are. We're, we're digressing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, designing, designing an energy market or an electricity market. Let's put it that way. Um, 
the way Europe is trying to redesign it is based on still having you know, concentrated power in the hands of power generating companies, as opposed mm -hmm. to a more distributed system and incentivizing people to basically take care of their own energy needs, so to say. And then creating, uh, you know, creating mi micro grids or micro grid markets where that energy excess consumed locally, mm. and consequently not require the importation of energy that's produced hundreds of miles away. Even though you might need to have that that fallback, it's not. It's not necessarily something that you want a behavior that you want to create. You know, we is there not a case for having opportunities for um, you know geographically well positioned places for um, for the, for the large scale production of electricity? So you know, I was thinking you know we, we mentioned the North Sea, particularly windy place, or particularly good for tidal power because the six meter tides you get up there. Now, these are all opportunities where, you know, if you best will in the world, if you're in a fairly crowded street of the north facing house, you don't see a lot of sunlight. You're not really going to do much with solar panels and there's no room for wind. So what do you do? You end up being a net Im importer. Sure. But you know, even, even if you are putting your, your wind power, um you know your your big towers you're still renting the the the, the land from the farmer or the, you know, whoever the land land owner is yeah so well why why are we not incentivizing that landowner to put up their own towers as opposed to you know subsidizing a company to do so yeah yeah no i get that so then the, the power generating companies, rather than them saying to the farmer, can we pay you this much rent for this period of time to put these things up? The farmer will be going to them or to equipment leasing companies and say, please install me this, this array on my land right. um, and I'll take care of selling it. Hmm. Or using it, you know, um, being self-sufficient. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, on a more philosophical level, uh, which I'm sure most people would contest, you know, we have stopped being a self-sufficient society. The vast majority of what we do actually depends on some service provider or some manufacturer selling us some good or service, as opposed to the individual being self-sufficient. I think we have to be a little bit careful about that. I think it's quite tempting to think that we could become fully self-sufficient. And there's, if you look at the history of China, for example, you know, there are various, have been moves there over millennia, various points where China traded heavily. And then there was periods where they shut the world off. And you think, you know, like in, in AD 1000, China was wealthier per head than in 1950, when the Communist Party just shut China off from the world and became self-sufficient, allegedly. So I think a degree of interconnected trade is good between countries. So, you know, we don't need to produce everything ourselves, but a healthy balance of who exports and who imports and who sends what goods around is, is, is not a bad state to be. No, yeah, on a national level, I would agree with you. I was talking more on the individual level. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, I have a parking spot out here. I don't have a car. You know, can I put photovoltaic cells there and, you know, generate my own power that comes into my apartment? I have a whole bunch of windows here. You know, can I put photovoltaic panels there and generate my own electricity? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've made that investment and, you know, I take care of myself. Yeah. And when I have an excess, I take care of my mm. neighbor. 
I don't want to buy it from, buy my energy from, you know, Florida power and lighting. I want to produce yeah. it myself and consume it myself and, you know, eventually share it or possibly share it with others. And, you know, when, or, or have a battery that I can use to store it for when I need it, you know, just be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of people, um, especially in the maritime world, who, you know, they're trying to make themselves as self-sufficient as they possibly can in terms of energy. Because they have all the economic motivation to do that. Well, there are also like um, boats in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of the ocean, so there's a big buy power from. <laughs> yeah. And they still want their, their Starlink you yeah. know, internet connection. Yeah. Hmm. But yes, you did mention tidal power before. That's actually a, an energy that most people don't really think about, but that could be very interesting in a lot of situations. It's very reliable. We know what the moon's doing. Yes, but unfortunately, uh, salt water does corrode. That's the biggest the problem, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it destroys things. Big. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Although I did see recently a... Um, the results of an experiment Microsoft did. They put a data center underwater for like 11, 10, 11 years. They just pulled it out because they needed to, you know, they wanted cheap cooling. And mm. the container that they put it in apparently didn't corrode. Everything, you know, all the equipment inside was quite safe. I think that's a different situation when you got a box underwater as opposed to moving parts subject to corrosion yes well you know salt water is a good electrolyte you know, put two different yeah. metals yeah you create you can create an electric current you can yeah maybe you don't need moving parts no i mean it's just really to do with the tides you know i've seen various schemes i've seen there's one i was reading about the effectively putting a windmill on the sea floor Mm -hmm. And as the tides come through, it just turns around. Yeah, in New it's York quite... City, they did that on the Hudson River. They did that. Because mm. it's quite tidal there. Currents are good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes. So let's go back to crypto because we like crypto. We do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's wrap things up a little bit here. I think. So we need to have smart meters. Mm -hmm. We need to have some form of subsidy, whether it's through a token reward or fiscal incentives um, for people to actually equip themselves with the proper equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, we need markets that work at a local level through microgrids for the exchange of value and electricity. And that same market needs to work at different levels, depending on um, whether that energy needs to be imported from, uh, well, imported and exported locally or from further and further away. Mm -hmm. Which would then allow you to create a unit of measure, a unit of currency, I should say, that would be you know, the electron or something like that. Um, KWH which would then become KWH yeah um, which would then be the unit of measure that would or the unit of currency I should say which then supplants the US dollar the ruble the euro or the remnant B as a reserve currency because you know, everything works with electricity and you know, there's no reason to have some national currency and we can we can tell all of those governments to get stuffed. And in your very rare vacations that you use to to fly occasionally, you've still got a wallet full of kilowatt hours that you can then spend in a hotel and at the uh, poolside bar, whatever. Or the plane or the train or yeah. the automobile, you exactly. know, whatever it is you're using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which then you know gives you a much better indication of 
what your energy consumption is, your energy mm -hmm. consumption and production is, which yeah. subs which is basically a subsidy subsidy to your modern way of living, and that could then have an effect on people's behavior, so that they consume more or less, or consume really what's needed, as opposed to this. Uh, rampant consumerism that we have that we've developed over the last x number of decades yeah so then be interesting who the winners and losers are with this it's like At in the, the moment of the we see day, you know you you is, want the is, individual to you know to be the winner because we don't want the you know, we don't want global warming. We don't want to, you know, completely bugger the the, the environment. You know, we don't want a whole bunch of you know, batteries that need to be recycled. You know, it's great to talk about you know electric vehicles, but you know they have accidents, they break down, they have a useful life that terminates. You know, how do you recycle those things? I know that there are companies out there that are you know, working on recycling these lithium batteries, but you know, we just don't have the infrastructure. And if, you know, recycling plastics and glass and paper as we are today is any indication, you know, we're going to suck at it. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. Excuse my French. But... Unless the right market models are in place. Right. Yeah. And those market Very good. those market models are microeconomic in nature, not macroeconomic. Mm. Which yeah. means that the losers are well, essentially the capital owners. Mm. You're not going to need big corporations, big companies anymore. Definitely not. And also, what will become interesting as well is where you live. So let, let's say you, you have got a pretty optimized house that you're pretty good at generating. Your consumption is well manageable because of all the, the measure you've taken. That's going to knock on the price of the property, isn't it? Where you live. Well, you already have that with all the ESG regulations that are coming into force in Europe. You know, mm -hmm. as a as a bank giving out a mortgage. Well, you're in the UK, so you you're not necessarily affected by this. But yeah. in the in the in the eurozone or the the EU, if you're a bank, can you give a loan to someone who buys a home with a G energy rating? Or can you only give a loan to somebody who has a A or a B energy rating? Yeah. You know, that, you know, there's the other side of the coin, you know, as you were mentioning before with, you know, with uh, with car leasing cars for three years and all of those different markets, you know, the downstream markets that exist afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, the circular economy, if you want to go even further you know you have all those esg regulations that are that you know, are impacting where the funds the the monies are going to finance these different activities um that can you know that are also incentive mechanisms you know if mm. i can't you know if before i sell my home I need to bring it up to an A rating and it needs to be certified in A rating because or else whoever is buying it can't get a loan. Yeah. You know, that becomes problematic for me. Exactly. So you have an incentive. Yeah. Well, you know, do the banks have the right to make those kind of loans? Probably not nowadays. But you know, the market is what it is. You can't stop mm. people from buying homes. Right. Nope. 
and then you have the recycling problem and then you have the circular economy and the production. I, I, I think you touched on it before, but you know, in order to do this energy transition, you would have to open up so many mines and mine so many, you know, so many raw materials and refine those real materials in order to make them useful to put yeah. them into this infrastructure that you know, you're creating more greenhouse gases than you know if you just left everything the way it was. Yeah. So you need to actually recycle a lot of those materials, which as we, you know, as I said before, we kind of suck at. You, know, you don't want to have to mine more metals. You don't want to have to mine more uh, oils. You, know, you want to be able to recycle everything as much as possible. Yeah, very much so. And there's also the finite number of materials you know that we've got. We we can't give a Tesla to every person in the world. No, nor should we. Nor should that be an aspiration. I, mean, I know for Elon no. Musk it's an aspiration, but for exactly. the rest of us, you know, I don't think so. But, yeah. you know, the, you know, that's why you know, people are talking about going and mining the moon, or going and mining asteroids, or mining you know, the 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 asteroid belt that goes around the mm. our solar system, the Kuiper belt. Is that what it's called? Yeah something like that it is yes. but that's more of a diversion isn't it um or yeah. you know colonizing mars and you're know, going to mining mars it's okay you know but if you think it was expensive bringing an ounce of oil from you know one place to another it's try bringing raw materials from another planet exactly asteroid. Yeah. You know, that's that's not going to be cheap either no no so basically, we've buggered everybody. Royally, yeah. Royally. Okay. But I think we should continue working on this uh, on this question of how to use crypto to incentivize people's consumption patterns. Definitely, get yeah. Get them used to using to using less. Yeah. Can't be that hard to do. You've got a, a global ledger. You have an account. It's got to be a way of doing it. Yeah. Well, I don't want to open up another subject because then we can get into the energy uh, production for the Bitcoin network and how green it is or not green it is or whatever. But, you know. We can just talk as about a one. <laughs> as a closing <laughs> remark, I will say, that anybody who was mining cryptocurrencies was not looking at it, was only looking at it on a cost basis, on an immediate cost basis, and not over the long term cost basis, um, is making a severe mistake. Because you want access to cheap energy to run your equipment, but you also want it to be cheap energy that uh, lasts over centuries mm -hmm. so i think you know, yeah. the, the we'll call them bitcoin miners you know, just to abbreviate but they're the, the first ones who should be interested in moving this industry forward and having yeah. the cheapest sources of energy but that's uh, you know with the longest duration possible um, that note, I think we're going to close here. But yeah. if you have some concluding remarks, please go ahead. No, it's, it's been a very interesting discussion, and I think um, we've touched on quite a few parts of it. But there's one thing, I mean, there's several things that we do know. There is an energy transition happening. The status quo isn't going to stay the same. We can't for the planet. So that there is there's an definite imperative to do that. There is an imperative, I think, for behavioral change, and that comes through, like he very well elaborated on the, on microeconomics about being able to create that sustainable account of yourself through energy production and consumption. So I think it is it lends itself well to 
um, a blockchain technology in doing this. Um, but I think there's probably still quite a few areas to explore and we should probably carry on after the Grok Chain podcast in brainstorming this and uh, throwing ideas around. Yes, we should. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.